Fright Pack Radio, a podcast produced by Winding Trails Media for writers by writers. Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the right pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas. Writing crazy stuff lately, and president of St. Louis Writers Guild, president of Winding Trails Media, and host of this crazy show. And with me today is my beautiful co-host. Hi, I'm Kathleen Kayembe. I write paranormal romance under the pen name Kaseka and Vita. I run uh, amorous writers and artists writing groups, and um, I have stories forthcoming from Lightspeed and Nightmare magazines. Yay! Oh, and I forgot to mention, before I turn this over to the next person, is come out to the St. Louis Public Library Central Branch on November 26th at 2 o'clock. I am going to be talking about story structure. For NaNoWriMo. For NaNoWriMo. And with Very us also, I guess I'm going to start here. Fedora Amos. I write Victorian whodunits like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis, and my newest one is Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West, which is a square nominee. Yay! Yay! Yay. <laughs> and you can find me on the 17th of November, along with several other people who are right here today, <laughs> at the Spencer Road branch in St. Charles at the Authors Expo, the local Authors Expo, and also going to be there is my name is jennifer solzer i'm going to be at the local authors uh st charles library expo as well Uh, i'm a children's book author and illustrator i will have uh children's books for sale dog park will be for sale there and you can check it out on amazon no matter what i won't have threadcaster for sale yet but we're working on that one uh if you're interested in finding out more about my in progress fantasy novel you can check it out on threadcaster.com Yay. Yeah. Uh, Brad R. Cook, author of the Iron Chronicles, which is a steampunk series. Uh, I, too, will be at the uh, local author event in St. Chuck. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have returned from the Bermuda Triangle for this event, so yay, fun, exciting stuff. <laughs> um, you can, however, get the end of the trilogy, the last in the Iron Chronicles series. Iron Lotus coming out the end of November, and definitely check out uh, November 26th, Main Street Books. We'll have the release party. It's going to be Small Business Saturday, so come up to Main Street and support a great local business. It's going to be the start of Christmas traditions on Main Street, which means all of Main Street's getting kicked back to the 1800s. It's going to be a great time, and we're going to steampunk it out. And you're going to be there from what time to what time? One to three. Can we dress like steampunk people if we want to? Heck yeah, I'm hoping that a bunch of steampunkers are going to come up and dress like steampunk. Because you know, I just bought a hat and some goggles. I I'll like totally that. Hey, hey Brad. Hey. Remember, remember the end of November. The <laughs> lotus is iron and nigh. I like that. <laughs> okay, and also we us. just had Guy Fox Day. Mm-hmm. Very fitting. Um, my name is George Soroy. I write uh, write science fiction for the young adult reader. Including Excelsior, which is available on ebook, paperback, and audiobook, narrated by myself, and the five part serial from Parts Unknown, available on ebook only. And hopefully, by the time you hear this, I will have finally finished and taken into account all of my notes from my editor <laughs> for Ever Upward, part two of the Excelsior Journey. I'm also vice president of the Missouri Writers Guild, so I hope to see you at our annual conference May 5th through 7th. Go to MissouriWritersGuild.org for more details. Mm-hmm. And I'm Melanie Lucas. Um, <laughs> Still squeeing a little bit about it. Yeah. Hey, I get to do this for She's at least like, a month, okay? You can't, you can't. <laughs> Melanie's <laughs> like, oh, this is my life, okay? I know already. <laughs> but every week I get to be reminded of this adorableness. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I, I haven't actually written anything that was, you know, fiction. But I do write uh, sci-fi and fantasy, and maybe at some point in the near future, I'll get back to that. I hope you do. You, all, you have been published in 
well, the scribe, but... <laughs> you know, I was just like, the other, the other side. By the way, check out the scribe. Which yeah. Is, uh, well, well, the Lewis Rider's Guild's Literary Magazine. magazine. Yes. Okay, well, yes, under a different name. I, <laughs> I, have, some non, I have some non-fiction writing you published. Should, you yes. should have. You own it that, so yours. Yes. I mean, you are the scientist in the group here. Yeah. Okay. You bring your expertise. Okay, real quick, because George threw out the Missouri Writers Guild Conference. Go for it. And that's awesome. Uh, totally going to throw out Gateway Con. Uh, you can now register for both the Writers uh, Conference side and if you would like to get a table in the Author Hall in the Readers Convention side. Check it out at singleswritersguild.org. Excellent. And today we're going to talk about interpreting the world through story. What is this? It, 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 it's an interpretive dance. It's like, what is this? What is this? Don't we all write in the same world? Um, Fedora, you write not. You write fiction set in a historical time. You've got to be historically accurate. Brad, while you do steampunk, you're technically it's a different world. I write historical fantasy. You write historical ah. fantasy. <laughs> it's a completely different world. I mean, how would you ever interpret a, the world you live in through the stories you write? And what about other science fiction? What about Star Wars, Star Trek? What about um, what about Hercule Poirot with fiction, westerns, historical romances? Well, Star Wars is real because it takes place in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> a long time ago. So it's the past, somewhere in the distance. It's a historical uh, it document. Exactly. It was found in a cave somewhere. Yes, the aliens. Okay, but in all in all honesty, how? The worlds world that we create for our stories, how are they, how are they interpretation, or do you interpret the world around you, or well, what are your thoughts? You definitely can, you definitely can, you can't help but have your eyes open and see like everything around you unfolding. One of the, you know, like, um, Brad, you, just met, uh, you guys have just mentioned Star Wars. Star, you know, like a big part of Star Wars, the, um, the real, um, I'm trying to, I'm blanking on what I was about to say. Inspiration. <laughs> there it is. That wonderful word, inspiration. A big part of that was the Vietnam War. And what was unfolding because of that. Because George Lucas, being being the hippie that he was, mm -hmm. you know, like at that time, was very much, you know, like very much against the Vietnam War and looked at, um, looked at the larger go uh, governmental bodies as the empire. You know, so it was basically using that and running with it and making it your own. Well, George is a great example to bring up on a lot of different ways, um, but I wanted to specifically say that he didn't stop that when he did the prequels either. The right. prequels are very much an analysis of uh, the Bush administration. And uh, it be, I know that I've talked about how stupid those movies are before, but there's a reason why there's a lot of political Senate scenes where they all shout at each other. That he included that because he considered the the rise of the empire, you know, striking, making wars uh, in foreign soil and just for the sake of gaining power. That was what he was interpreting out of uh, so the world that he was in. But at the, same, <laughs> at the same time, though, the, you know, episode one came out in 99 during the Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. So there was like, you know, there were definitely some seeds of the Bush administration dropped in, especially Anakin's line, if you are not with me, you are my enemy. Yes. Like, that's purely... And uh, this is how freedom dies in thunderous applause. Yep. <laughs> All right, that was just my bit. I just oh, wanted yeah. to say I liked your example. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say is that um, I think the only people who are writing truly the world around them are journalists. Uh, they're writing nonfiction, they're writing very factual stuff. I think the rest of us are interpreting what we see. Um, if well, they're you interpreting are, what they see, too. They're well, trying they, desperately not to, but they are. Okay, maybe some journalists. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's caveat that. Okay. Uh, but I would say that, like, if you are writing a contemporary novel, and you're setting it's a thriller or something like that, like, you know, any of your Jack Ryan novels or anything like that that, that comes across as, you know, as modern day, or if you're writing Eat, Pray, Love, mm -hmm. you know, set in today's day, I still think you're interpreting the world around you. Um... Obviously, I interpret the world to a greater extent than others because I write fantasy. Um, I think those of us that write fantasy, we're, we're taking the world and we're mashing it up and mixing it up in a giant mixing bowl and then pouring out and baking some cool cake. But, you know, 
I think really the people who are giving you just straight on nonfiction is probably the only people where you're getting anything that is truish to the world. I don't know if I agree, but let's go ahead. Okay. So I want to break this down a little bit more <laughs> because when I hear interpreting the world through story, I think about how our brains work and how everybody is the hero of their own story. Um, we're all the main characters in the stories of our lives and how we tell that story to ourselves and to other people plays a large part in what shapes us as people. Um, there are people who, you know, will go to see a counselor or a psychiatrist because the story they tell themselves about such and such event is detrimental to their lives, like to their life. It's, it's hurting them. And so when they learn to reframe and tell the story from a different perspective with a different kind of point, mm -hmm. they're able to move past issues that they previously thought would be hampering in their whole lives. Now that's a really simplistic version of what goes on in counseling and a really simplistic way of explaining um, how our brains process the world through story, but that's what we do. Um, so the way we, the way the world is filtered into us is story. Everything we take in is story in some fashion. What we do as writers then, um, how we use those stories to write our own work, uh, it depends on what kind of genre you're writing in because a, journal, a journalist is writing a story. It's true to what happened, but it's from their perspective. A fantasy writer is cobbling together many different stories still from their perspective. I reserve the right to disagree with Brad later on, as I so often do. Right now, <laughs> I want to, to talk about what Kathleen said. I think it goes actually beyond what you're saying here, hmm. that the stories we tell ourselves, that is how we create the world that we live in. Yay. Every day, when you get up in the morning, don't you tell yourself what you need to do today? what your to-do list is, and what you hope the day will bring for you, and what you would be disappointed if it does happen. If you have bad news to deliver, don't you think long and hard about how to say that bad news? Mm -hmm. And if you have good news to share, isn't that a delight for the entire day? It's the stories that we tell ourselves that create the lives we want to live. And if we don't tell ourselves the right stories, we don't live so happily. And I would add, moreover, that how we remember things depends a lot on story, too. Because if you have a list of things to remember that have no context, it'll be harder to remember them than if they all relate somehow in a storified way. Well, we bring up, we've moved away from writing. Though. Oh, we'll move back. Don't worry. I was I about got to. Just say. Mr. Jump the Gun. <laughs> <laughs> Just say. You all um, want to disagree with me, but you're all talking oh, about Oh, I see how it is. <laughs> Stop interrupting her while she uh, takes uh, it back to writing. I have a thing to say. <laughs> Go for it. Um, I wanted to, to say, yes, these is a, this is all very good points, but I take this even further into uh, outside of ourselves as, our, as storytellers and into the fact that every story has an audience, and specifically in history, back before the time of written language, storytelling was how we passed wisdom and, and lessons on to each other. The, the pictures on the walls of caves that were drawn by our oldest ancestors, those were stories to tell people how to hunt, uh, the events of a specific day, uh, about a person perhaps. Those stories were told to educate their fellow man about these things, whether it's, you know, don't eat the blackberries because they're poisonous and they killed your uncle, or it's uh, remember the story of... Uh, of you know, remember the story of Oedipus and all those things you should not do because look what happened to him <laughs> and that kind of thing these are lessons ways to teach lessons to people that keep them interested that keep them entertained and have been added to our storytelling culture throughout all of known history um, and to branch off of that uh, if you take the stories of the story of say don't eat the blackberries they'll poison they killed your uncle uh -huh. kind of thing that leads into how we write stories now and how to tell an effective story. To tell an effective story, you have to pay attention to which details you put in and what things you leave out. So like 
let's say your uncle was walking through the woods and he saw blackberries and then he saw a tiger mm -hmm. and he ate the berries and followed the tiger. The tiger is not really important. Mm -hmm. Important. The point is the uncle, the berries and his death. Uh -huh. So that's what you would keep in. So even, even then, um, people were figuring out effective ways to tell stories to get across the points they wanted to an audience that was, you know, I propose the term story crafting. Yes. <laughs> so let me throw this out there and um Ow. Uh -huh. You hit me with it. Well that was the You're end. being you're being so so aloof and philosophical in this, it's See, getting a little abstract. She's going new yeah. journalism over on me over there, not journalism. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I was going back to Brad's comments earlier. Awesome. Um but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um I'm gonna actually ask a few people around the table some questions. And Purposely picking that, picking you because you don't write modern day stories, stories told today, as in this story takes place in 2016, wherever on the earth. So no contemporary settings. No contemporary settings. So, but I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to ask each and every one of us this question, and that is, how does your world in the frame that you have it mirror? the world we're currently living in, or does it? And I'll ask for a volunteer first, so I'm not just throwing up the name. But we know Brad okay, and Fedora are on the list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brad and Fedora are on the list, mm -hmm. but they're not the only ones. Well, I was drawn to the period of the late 1800s because it is so much like our own period today. And I see these parallels, and I hope that by writing about the uh, various the difficulties of that time period that people might get some insight into the current time period because the late 1800s were a time of great innovation. It was, well, we had the telephone, the automobile, all kinds of wonderful new inventions that were very scary to people in the last 25 years of the 1800s and the modern innovations of electronics in the last 25 years have been equally scary to huge numbers of people and we know that there are various kinds of problems which crop up all of the hacking and the stealing of identity that couldn't happen perhaps nearly so readily as before uh -huh. and so it's a time of great challenges and a time when it's very difficult to understand and things t seem terribly fragmented so that you need to find some interior strength in order to make it all work for you. And you, got, and you have to keep on your toes with modern day stuff as well. Absolutely. In fact, I had today, a, just a complete sidebar, but what, what would turn out to be a fake account, but a friend of mine's husband had been cloned on Facebook and started contacting me. The only way I could find out was when they started talking, but oh yeah, you're not. So, okay, go ahead. Go uh, I was just thinking that related to that, I like reading old science fiction. By old, I mean science fiction that was written not that long ago, but minimum 30 years ago. Uh, nowadays, 50 or 60 years ago is even better. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting when you read it, because some of it's better written than others, but the point is, some of the things that read the most false are the things that the readers of the day would have identified with the most. So I guess when you're when you're creating the world, maybe the key is some of the details have to seem familiar, and that will pull your audience into the unfamiliar. Um, uh, not an old example, well, not as old as some of the examples, but one that's just come to mind is a stranger in a strange world. Um, I think that's Heineken, but I'm mm. very bad with names. Mm. Heineken, Heineken. Heineken, thank you. Yeah. Heineken's yeah. a beer. Heineken's 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 <laughs> Which you don't it's have to drink to write, just so you know. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But um, point is, this is a, a man that was raised by Martians and came back to Earth. But it's funny because a lot of the technology and things he likes and all the, a lot of the social predictions he makes are true. They actually happen, the mega church and the politics and all that. But some of the things that ring the most false in it are things that were mirrors of how the world really was working when he was writing it, I think, in the 60s. So, it, and it, you can see it much more clearly when you read things that were written several years ago. 
Yes. Yeah. Dick Tracy had an Apple Watch. Yeah. 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 Well, there's like, uh, and, and Apple Watch happened because of Dick Tracy. Or Google yes. Watch. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think partly this is why John Carter failed. Because John Carter is based on John Carter of Mars. The movie. Yeah, the, That's yeah. why the movie failed. The movie. But, you know, <laughs> why the movie failed is because the series that it's based off of is based on a Mars that no longer exists. Mm-hmm. We know right. too it's much Mars about it. That, yeah, mm-hmm. we know way more about Mars than, you know, they did at the time of John Carter. And you could, you could fantasize more about Mars, which is why I think that John Carter of Mars didn't do very well. But to answer your question about my world... Uh-huh. Um, so most of the time, my 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 world is a setting uh, just for me to take place. However, um, with the Iron Chronicles, um, I do a lot with uh, secret societies that secretly control the world. Mm. Um, is that mirroring today? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how much I should talk about this. The Illuminati is going to come kick my butt, but no. Uh, but seriously, no. There are you know I do a lot of with cabals that control the world behind the government. Um, I do a lot with kind of international relations. There's a lot with race. You know, all of these kinds of things play into, you know, and I I try and use those universal themes because, God willing, in a hundred years, somebody picks up a copy of Iron Horseman and reads it, I want them to to still have some, you know, some resonance that would hold true even to somebody's life in there. Um, is it a direct comparison to the world that we live in? Probably not really. Um, I hope not, because I really don't want the uh, horsemen of the apocalypse to appear. Um, but you yeah, say that so, now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, behave. Because yeah. by this point, we know the outcome. Uh-huh. Yeah. Speaking of what Brad didn't say, <laughs> Dorothy Sayers wrote uh, the Sir Peter Whimsey mysteries in, I think, the 20s, 30s, 40s. Uh-huh. And one of the things that she would do that uh, I think relates to this topic is she would write characters who held opposing viewpoints to her own. And she would, in some cases, bring them to their logical conclusion. And the person would be a murderer because they saw no value in human life. Mm. Um, but she would take these um, dominant modes of thought of her day and just explore them through a character. And um, that's something, that kind of a practice has been helpful for me because there are plenty of people I disagree with. And I don't understand how they could possibly see the world in such a way that they continue to act as they do. But writing certain characters, like um, the main character in the story I'm working on right now is a bully. And I like him so much. I love him. And I never would have if I was just trying to see him from the outside perspective. But internally, I know who he is and I understand where he's coming from now. So I'm able to kind of understand bullies a little bit better because this is the kind of character I'm writing. So I think one of the one of the benefits of being a writer is being able to see something in the world that you don't understand and then try and understand it through writing and through character and kind of study things that way. It, it gives you another way of seeing the world as a writer, and it's something that, you know, I think people should should try out if they're unsure. Like, mm-hmm. I've done this when I disagree with my dad about things, and I'm like, oh, I still think you're wrong, but I get <laughs> it. Okay, okay. Um, regarding, regarding one of the worlds that I've created, um, my five-part serial from Parts Unknown started off um, just as a standalone novel that was... Uh, mainly focusing on the the behind-the-scenes power struggle of this wrestling promotion that's become so popular. It's become the last remaining sport in all of uh, of America. Very similar to to the 75 film Rollerball. Um, (laughs) And and, uh, one of my personal uh, guilty pleasures, The Running Man. Um, So, but, um, but in the nine years that happened since the original publication, in 2002 and starting the now 550 page serial in 2011 I kept an eye on the world around me and I noticed that uh, that the American people were getting uh, more and more caught up in reality TV to the point where a non-presidential election year election uh, would actually get less uh, less uh, interaction than a typical American Idol uh, calling, mm-hmm. so it became very, um, very scary 
in a sense, because I knew that, you know, like when, um, I believed that, you know, and still do, that, you know, like if the American people become more and more and more apathetic, then those who are not will gain more and more and more power. And that to me felt like it was worthy to kind of wean into, weave into this story of From Parts Unknown. So now it's become like a major element of that because uh, what the, what my uh, promotion is being used at, used as by the government is a tool of distraction. So that they can go about their business while keeping the American people entertained. And so that to me was just like, that was a matter of me just looking around and seeing how the world was going for the last nine years at that point. The bread and circus. There's yeah. nothing to see here. Exactly. Move along. Move along. Fedora. Yes. Yeah. Move fedora? Oh. <laughs> what if? That is the basis of most fiction, I think. What if things were different? Or what if things are the way that I'm seeing them? It's quite liberating as well as an educational experience for a writer to try to put himself or herself in somebody else's shoes, to walk there for a mile or two miles. It's especially liberating to create villains because you allow yourself to think about things that you never would think about doing in real life. So it's quite liberating. And so is the entire idea of what if. And you get to explore that as a writer. And if you're lucky, other people might be interested in reading it too. Your what if, yes. That's, that's the most important two words of our entire industry. What if. One of the things I've noticed about all writers, and it's a way they, you know, having been in president of St. Louis Writers Guild myself, uh, and having been in publishing, it's a way that I've come to spot writers. You know, because you, you find a lot of people who want to write. Mm -hmm. The true writers, we all tend to be the same. And I think one of the things that, that marks us is our ability to see the world around us for more than just what is the facade in front of us. You know, I, things I've noticed is that we all listen to conversations. Over here, listen in to people having conversations. Why? We want to, we want to experience that interaction that's not necessarily our interaction but two other people interacting. We watch people. Uh, I've known most writers to be the types who like to sit there and watch people go by, to see the different types of people, to see how humans interact. And I think part of the reason we do this is because it is our job as writers to take the world around us, reinterpret it in different ways through what ifs and you know other ways, and then give that in a nice palpable form to the readers who necessarily aren't the types who are going to, you know, stare at the world and ask all these questions and then, you know, present that to them. I think it's something that as writers we do a lot of. We we see the world around us, we see it in different ways, and that allows us to then create characters, create villains, create things that haven't been thought of before, make people ask questions, you know. I think these are things that are common to all writers. Uh, you know, not that others don't do this, just that this is something common amongst all writers. Well, all writers, we have the same questions we always have to ask. Now I'm going to take you back to your journalism situation. What what are the questions every journalist has to ask in Florida and you'll be next? Who, Who? What? When? Where? Why? How? And how? How? Why to? Why is good? Yep. <laughs> And Who's that, paying me? No, sorry. Yeah, no, and then that, that, well, that's yeah, part that of a different be, that story different that the journalist tells himself. Right. And that's the five elements, yes. the simple five questions that drive us to find the stories. Five or six. six. I, I wasn't counting six. six questions. Six questions. This is proof why I'm not an accountant. I write instead. Um, <laughs> it is that you've got to dive into it. I don't care if you're diving into it as a journalist out there or if you're diving into it as a fictionist. Fictionist. I'm gonna oh, put that fictionist. in my resume. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Well, that's <laughs> on my business card now. Fictionist. Yes. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna twirl an imaginary mustache as I shake someone's hand and say, "Hello, I'm a fictionist." Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Well, I think I'm gonna take my time now at attacking Brad. Well, <laughs> no, 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 you're the one who used the word attack. <laughs> no. When he talked about journalists, 
as telling it like it is. Well, I don't think they do. I don't think anyone tells it like it is because no one knows what it like what it is. It's only what you think, and therefore, when you write, you put in some things, you leave out other things, and what you put in and what you leave out determines what your view of things is. It doesn't have anything necessarily to do with the real world at all. Look, for example, at all, at all of the media, which have such very different takes on this current election. Oh, and it's now a past all, election. Any, any election. <laughs> any election. Yeah. And it's... And it's all about what they choose to put in and what they take out. And then let's not forget that they twist whatever there is there to make it into their own philosophy of what things ought to be. So it's an odd mix of things that we actually get, and none of it is the real exact truth. It can't be. I agree with that on modern journalism. But that's not actually the way journalism is supposed to be. Well, yeah, and never did because it can't. Right. Because Humans, everybody has a slant. Well, Humans in the nineteen fallible. sixties there came out and this is all I was gonna add and I'm throwing this little bit of blood into the water now that you guys all turn over it. <laughs> it is, and I'm waiting for somebody with a shark fin to come through something through it. Anyway. But in the nineteen sixties out came a new form of journalism called new journalism. And you see that a lot in what's called advocacy journalism, which is a genre of journalism which is interpreting the world through, not through facts, but through, and I'm putting this in quotes, truth. No, so I'm keeping that word truth. It's not really the truth, because nobody can tell what the real truth is, or to borrow from a favorite TV show of Jen and I, hmm. Babylon 5, truth is a three-edged sword. <laughs> um, but it is their truth, and that's what they're pushing forward. Now I'll let you two fight over it. Who's going to be next? Kathleen, I, can tell I was I was going to say thank you, Fedora. I 100% agree. Um, the problem with telling the story of an event um, for journalists and for anyone who has ever been at an event or experienced an event is that you're seeing and experiencing this thing through your own point of view, which means all of the experiences you have had in your life are part of what make you as a person and part of what um, what determines your perception of what happens. So if all of us were talking about what happened in this room today, uh -huh. we would all tell something about, you know, we all sat down and we all talked, but what we remember from this conversation, what we remember was contributed and how we experienced this situation would be different because we are all different people coming to this room with a wealth of experiences that are different. It doesn't mean we're lying about any of it. It doesn't make any of our points of view wrong. It doesn't make what we say not the truth. But everyone experiences the world differently. And so the truth for everyone is going to come out a little bit differently. And what we leave in or take out of the explanation of what happened is determined by our past experiences and what we think is important. Yeah, so oh, uh, I was going to say um, there is a news station that is fair and biased hmm. as its tagline and when Saddam Hussein was alive and I believe Barack Obama was running for office they would say Barack Hussein Obama they would not they would always say his middle name mm -hmm. and that brings um, the connotation or rather it, it kind of implies in the subconscious of viewers mm -hmm. that he and Saddam Hussein are connected and that is a deliberate choice it's all truth. Mm -hmm. That is his name. But what you choose to leave in and what you choose to leave out really determines what people will interpret based on your story. Good time, Daniel Rufus. But real quick, I think you said that when Brock was running, when President yeah, Obama was running, yeah. Saddam was already dead. Yes. Yeah, so I, 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 I may have misheard. Not that that changes anything of your point. Yeah. Okay. What you said is absolutely right. Yeah. All right. Um, but yeah, he was still a, definitely a yeah. big figure in the American mindset. Well, everyone knew Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to make that choice was a deliberate choice. Yes. And before it turns over to George, I, you said you brought it up. I can't want to toss this in. My background is I'm also a paralegal. Mm -hmm. I'm not an attorney. I can't give anybody legal advice. If I did, then I'd go to jail. That's why I always have my all rules around the table. You've always heard me do my preamble. But one of the things about... The law and practicing of law is no. <laughs> eyewitness testimony, which is the first thing journalists go for. 
if you ever watch this on television especially, they want the eyewitness. They want the person who's there. Eyewitness testimony is the most untrustworthy source of information. And the and my one of my professors back in the day brought this home with a true story of that he had, which was he had three judges in his car, and they were going to lunch, and they witnessed a car accident that happened. All three judges who witnessed the same car accident were exactly in the same car that was involved in the car accident, all had three different points of view of who caused the car accident. Hmm. And, there, and that is a fact of eyewitnesses. You have a point of view. And this is when we write our stories and write our characters. All characters have a different point of view from each other, even if they happen to totally agree with each other. Let's say Fedora and I totally agree on something. She's going to have a different point of view than I do, even though we've got crossover. So, um, just, a, just a couple of quick things to add to that um, particular network that, uh, the Kath that Kathleen mentioned. One of my favorite examples of their quote-unquote journalism was um, in uh, 2007 or 2008, when, um, no, uh, 2006 actually, when Scooter Libby was the only person who was convicted of the of the whole uh, case of the outing of the CIA agent Bobby oh, Plain. Yeah. Uh, uh, Scooter was convicted on four out of five charges. Um, don't don't quote me on which ones they were, but Fox News made sure. Oh, there I am mentioning them. Sorry. Um, they made sure to put down on their bottom ticker. Scooter Libby found not guilty of this charge. Yeah. And that's all they said. Mm -hmm. um, so to add on to what uh, Fedora had said, basically, like what uh, what journalism has become these days is the world's largest game and most infuriating game of telephone. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you're basically like, you know, you have the actual incident, and then one person goes ahead and reports on it, and then they go ahead, and then that information gets fed onto another source, and regarding whether, which way they slant in terms of which way they are, and you know, like the left wing or right wing, they're going to interpret it this way. The right wing one is going to interpret it this way, and so on and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And what we have right now, the main problem is that we don't have any, we barely have any more, any actual grounding of the reality <laughs> of it all. So right now you basically have so many people that have been told that the mainstream media is lying to you about everything, so no one can even agree that the sky is blue anymore. And that is that right now is, is the is the main problem. And rumors, sure rumors, sure rumors have become facts. Well, yes. Yes. this is clearly shown by the what color is the dress. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I kind of want to bring us back well, here. Yeah. Bring us back real fast, but I want to say, what, just because we just tossed out Fox News, there are MSNBC is just as guilty, and there's also a lot of other ones on both sides of the aisle that you just they did. There's just no reality to the wizard. NPR saying. tries to do a good NPR job. Does, oh, NPR, NPR does. I'm going to throw it into journalism because we're not talking NPR. about journalism. <laughs> We're talking about partisan journalism. We're talking about entertainment journalism. Well, actually, this is yes. what I want to get back to. We're, talking we're actually about talking about how we interpret the world. Well, yeah, no, we'll let him finish that, my, and my then I will bring is it back. That we're not actually talking about journalism. We're talking right. about entertainment journalism and partisan journalism, which are two right. very different things from what is classic journalism or what is, you it's know, you mentioned Which is really and, hard to find, yeah, classic you journalism. Yeah, you NPR, and you've got yeah. the AP, you know. And BBC. That's about... Yeah, yeah. BBC, BBC even. even. No. So, so... Because you've got the AP and NPR, are probably your two biggest sources. There are others. Mm -hmm. But there are people out there, and if you notice, their stories are short. Mm -hmm. It is a couple of paragraphs. It is they are not happened. stories, really. They're just facts. Yeah, yeah, just the facts, throwing it out, and then it's left to others to interpret. You know, that's where you're going to get the truest sense of any event. Mm -hmm. Or NPR like to tries out. to give equal time to both sides. But both CNN and Fox, to, to put the two you know, sides up there, um, you know, half of their day is devoted to entertainment, not yeah. news programs. Right. So, so, now that we've had the journalism talk, I want to <laughs> yeah, yeah. dovetail off of that and twist it back toward the writing. Yay! Um, that's me clapping. What we've, what Brad has pointed out with partisan, uh, partisan news stories and news being called stories nowadays, anyway, mm -hmm. is that 
Um, they're being told so that a certain interpretation of the events is what is communicated to the audience. Right. And um, what we as writers do is we take characters and we take events and we tell them at a slant so that our audience, our readers, will see them from the perspective that we want them to see uh, the events or the character from. So in the story where I'm writing a bully, um, he's one of the, the heroes of the story. He's somebody that I want the audience to sympathize with, not at first, but then to come to understand. And that means I have to bring out certain aspects of his personality at first that are more horrible and show him as a bad person. Wow. And then through the course of the story, I have to show more of his internal life and display him trying to be a good person so that the audience will sympathize with him. Mm -hmm. um, in Nancy Cress's book, Beginnings, Middles, and Ends, she says that in the, the first paragraph, the first page, the first chapter, by that point, the reader will have an idea of how they're supposed to feel about your main characters. So they'll know if they should be sympathizing with them, if they should be kind of observing them but not really empathizing. Um, and if, you know, they should dislike this person, as Fedora and I were talking about villains. So how you write, what you bring in, what you leave out is, again, really important for how the audience will experience what you're writing. So how do we do things like that? Like, how do we, how do we allow an audience to get into a perspective and to see the story that we're writing from a certain point of view that, you know, they wouldn't necessarily agree with? How do Gently. We Gently. Very gently. <laughs> softly, softly, catchy monkey. What? <laughs> what? Unpack that one for me, will you? <laughs> You've never heard that? Okay. No, I've never heard that. No. You, you take little bitty steps along the way. Don't blast them with it on the first page. You have to lead them into it. Well, it's time for me to step on my character soapbox because everything, as far as I'm concerned, comes down to character. Yes. Uh, you pick the character you want your story told from the point of view of. And that, you're, the rest of the world is interpreted through that character's point of view. Now, if you're writing a story about uh, an anti-hero or a villain or whatever, you can see the world through his point of view and the way that you phrase that will then, you know, you don't necessarily need the audience to agree with him. Uh -huh. But the story is watching your character experience their life or experience the tale or go against the villain or the circumstance or whatever. Um, the way that you introduce sort of tough issues, maybe you want to help, you know, you, you say you're writing a book because you're really, really passionate about, um, well, we'll take Kathleen's example with her story. I haven't read her story. I don't know how it turns out, but let's say you're, you're addressing a bullying topic and you decided to approach it from the bully angle. It doesn't the goal of the book is not going to be to make everyone say we should all be bullies. Bullies are the right way to do it. The way to the way you're communicating that that message, the message portion is by taking a character and giving us a good story about a good character who's written well, who's written humanly so we can understand his side and we can watch this character change organically and learn his lesson as it were. I'm going to guess that's how that goes. This is different from writing a message book. <laughs> yes. When you're writing a book specifically for the message and not to explore something. When you're exploring a character, exploring a topic, that gives us room, us being the audience, uh, room to, to get to know somebody and understand something that we hadn't previously understood. Uh, when you're telling a message story and everything is always driving the message in and we're not allowed to have a character, uh, then the audience can't connect and doesn't and learns less because it's more of a textbook or a lecture. And the the phrase I don't know who said the phrase it's famous but if you're writing a message book, you know it's like you don't want to write a book just just write an essay because that's obviously what you want to do. You're not going to trick your audience into learning a lesson unless they can uh, interpret that lesson you're putting in front of them into their own lives by watching other people experience it or by seeing something that is relatable to them or something like that. Character is a fantastic vehicle for doing that because you take a person who could be somebody you know, could be you, could be your friend or your mother or some, so, you know, they reckon, you recognize a human being inside this character and then you can see that character reacting and then we as human creatures learn and adapt by emulating what we see. 
you know, it's we're a, we're a sea monkey do flock of birds type creature. That when the whole group is deciding that, you know, we think that we should all go over here. It was like, oh, have you heard about the new sandwich they have at Subway? We should all try the new sandwich at Subway. That sounds like a good idea. Let's all try the new sandwich at Subway. We're all moving together and we're learning from each other based on, you know, that guy said the sandwich was good. We'll go try it. If we were completely separate from character, if we were completely separate from story, then we shouldn't care what that guy said about that sandwich. That shouldn't intrigue us. Uh, we should just experience that. So... Message story versus character. Character is a great vehicle to teach a lesson. Don't teach the lesson before you tell a story. One one uh, genre that I feel that you know I'm pretty sure we can all kind of, you know kind of agree on that is able to combine all of that, combine the lesson and the and the you know and the story and the character and everything is science fiction mm -hmm. because you can use science fiction as a vehicle for telling. Difficult stories. I'll have fantasy in, in there. Yes. As yes. Well. Yes. In in an entertaining fashion, and one of the great things that you can do is you can take your character, you can take your main character, and take him on this, him or her on this fantastical journey, where they will discover something that you're really trying to kind of weave in. And one of the great examples for you know, like in, in my opinion, is the original Planet of the Apes film mm -hmm. because it combines both. It combines the it combines the the lesson with this with one of the greatest endings you'll ever see in any film, mm -hmm. um, and it also does it as Jen was saying through a character through a character's point of view. You have Charlton Heston as astronaut George Taylor, mm -hmm. who is so disgusted with his world. Now keep in mind, like at that particular world at that time when the film came out, it was 1968. Mm -hmm. What was going on? A whole lot of a whole lot of. Uh, um, Dis, dis, uh, disarray going on. Yeah. You know, you had the Vietnam War escalating. You had you know Nixon coming into power, Johnson refusing to be in power. Kennedy was killed, was dead for only five years, mm -hmm. and so you have a whole lot of civil unrest going on. So who wouldn't want to just go ahead and leave that planet? Yeah. But then all of a sudden, you take him on this journey and realize where he was all along. It's just like this could be us. <laughs> this could wind up, you know this could wind up happening if we continue to go down down this path. So, you know, like, just to, just to say that, like, through science fiction and fantasy, you can tell these amazing stories and still be able to weave a, a very valuable lesson into it. Because the memorable parts of Planet of the Apes are the parts, the character parts, the story parts, right. you know, Bright yeah. Eyes and, and all the slaving and everything Damn like that. Yeah. It's like we know, that's the part we remember, but the thing that we learned, that we gleaned out of the story was the, you know, you crazies, you all blew it up. Yep, yep. <laughs> Uh, I will also add to that that art, uh, anthropologists have now declared that modern apes are in the Stone Age due to their tool making abilities and all that. So, Planet of the Apes may not be that far off. Mm -hmm. um, we have to I, set a good example. Exactly. <laughs> um, one of the things I was going to say, not to kind of say anything about what you guys were doing or mm -hmm. about fantasy or sci fi, because I completely agree, but there are message books out there. Mm -hmm. And the way that you can do this is by uh, having authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, Cheryl Rainfeld is an amazing author. She writes um, some amazing YA novels. Um, one of them is Scars. It is all, it's a book about cutting. Mm. Um, now, it's an amazing book, and if you read it or if you ever hear Cheryl talk about it, it will rip your heart out and stomp on it. And, you, know, <laughs> you know, yeah. But the reason is, is that Cheryl will show you her scars. And she has no problems with that. And if you get to know Cheryl, it's, uh, she's had a crazy life. And, you know, I love that she's now, a, you know, an accomplished author and, you know, can talk about all this kind of stuff. But um, having that level of authenticity drives that message home in a way that other books won't have an impact on. It doesn't feel as preachy as if you're being told about exactly. something on the surface level. Exactly, and it's not—it's not a biography. Cheryl's not telling you about her life. Mm -hmm. She's this is a character, a YA character who's you know having issues and everything like that. But because she has that level of intimacy, of knowledge with the subject matter, it it comes across in a way that really is just wrenching. I mean, it just—it's soul wrenching. I have to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, 
I was going to bring up representation because we're talking a bit about message books and message characters, which are awful. Um, and how we see the world has a lot to do with like how we envision the world ourselves and the world that we could live in has a lot to do with what we see in the stories that we take in. So um, there, there are studies that have been done um, about like kids of different races who watch cartoons on TV and then are asked what they think they can grow up to be. And um, uh, little white boys would think, you know, I can be president. And until Barack Obama was president and actors like I think Morgan Freeman maybe were presidents in movies, mm -hmm. they never would say something like, I can be president, because there was no, th no story that they were taking in where they were a president. Like, that's not something that's available to me. And a lot of kids were also had some racist ideas about, you know, what black people could and couldn't do, because the cartoons they were watching only showed them in certain roles. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with women. It's the same thing with other minorities. Like, there's a big problem when the the overarching story that you're getting from culture in various in in all the different um, from all different sources are telling you the same story. So kids with asthma, if you've ever had asthma and watched a TV show or a movie with someone with asthma in it, you would think maybe I have asthma wrong because they're always like they're sucking on their inhaler yes. all the time. That is not how that works. I haven't yeah. used my inhaler in the last five minutes. I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> but like... The steroids are rotting out the lining of my lungs. Mm -hmm. But like, if somebody saw someone having an asthma attack, they'd be like, where's the inhaler? Puff. Puff more. Puff more. That's, that's not responsible. That's not good storytelling. But the dominant story, no one has actually researched how asthma works. So... And you don't need to have asthma to write realistic asthma. You exactly. just need to do the extra legwork that not having asthma requires, which mm -hmm. is research, perhaps talking to somebody who has it, who deals with it. Uh, you can send Brad a letter. He likes <laughs> to stand up for <laughs> asthma uh, up suffers. For <laughs> um, so there, there's a little, a little <laughs> research to be done. But one of the things that we've talked about um, is that writing allows you to ask questions of the world that maybe not everybody does. Brad mentioned that earlier. Uh -huh. One of the things that I think is our responsibility as writers is to question the stories that we are told through about ourselves and other people through our culture. Um, if we had lived in the 1950s, I wouldn't necessarily be in this room because I am a black woman and the rest of this group is white. I might not know many of these people. No, no we're all a bunch yeah, of Yeah, I would actually it's still be counted as white. Okay. So, um, <laughs> if no one had questioned You're whether black people white. and white people, like why they had to be separate, we might be in an entirely different world. Mm -hmm. And if no one had questioned why only um, white Christian men were presidents, we might be in a different world. And we have a biracial president He's a black president because of the stories we tell ourselves in America about what it is to be black versus white. Mm -hmm. But I will point out he is half white, and that is a story we as a culture are telling ourselves and telling each other um, that I think we should question. But who we include in our stories and the roles we include them in is really important, and it sends a message completely apart from your story. So. Think about what you're telling people by the kind of characters you cast in whatever role. I think that what you're getting around to is that writers need the broadest possible kind of education, not just from books, but from real life. And so there are three traits that seem to me that are outstanding for writers to cultivate and develop. And the first one is to be a voracious reader. Read a lot. Read a lot of everything. Things that don't necessarily, that you want to read, but that you think might be interesting, and by golly, you find they are interesting when you do read it. Well, second is curiosity. I think readers are curious about everything in the world and want to know about everything in the world. And finally, you've got to have the courage to go to places that you would not ordinarily go. You have to go to the theater in Madrid and listen to a play 
that's in Spanish and you don't speak Spanish, but you can observe an audience that is completely different from your own. So have courage, read a lot, and be curious about everything. One of the scenes I love in the Avengers is Iron Man. And that was the interpretation of the cat. Yes, yeah, one of the cat. Um, he dropped yeah, the mic. It's the scene where uh, where Iron Man talks about having learned that thing over the course of the night. Um, as a writer, I can't tell you how many times I've done that. Mm. Had a question about something, wanted to learn something, read everything I could in a single night, and the next day I'm way more learned than I was the previous day. Um, it's a wonderful thing. It's something I love about being a writer. Because as a writer, I'm constantly asking questions. Could like just doing be, research all yeah, the time. Research all the time. And not even research that's dedicated to a book. Um, yeah, but into, basically the having a knowledge of, you know, that wide knowledge base is a wonderful thing. It leads you to all kinds of discoveries. And researching, uh, you, you two talking about research is very important because you write things that happened in history. Uh, I just want to say as a fantasy writer, I do my fair share of researching too, although my researching is mostly uh, what does a dead body smell like after three days? <laughs> or what happens when you drown to death? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> oh, guess what I found yesterday in a walnut I was cracking and about to eat from? A maggot! That was fascinating. Uh, after my initial <laughs> okay. shriek of horror, because there's a maggot in this thing, um, I it was on a paper plate, and I just looked at it for like 10 minutes, and my family was like, throw it outside, kill it. And I was like, mm, ooh, it moves so funny. Just put my face right up against it. Like, you learn all sorts of different things as a writer, and you get to be curious after your initial shock of horror about now, so many things. And now there's going to be a maggot in your next story, I bet. Oh, the thing is, though, there was a maggot in the story that I sold to um, to Nightmare Magazine. And I was like, huh, if I had seen this earlier, maybe I would have written it slightly differently. Not really, because I only had it in, like, a sentence. But now I know exactly what it, what it, it was would doing. Have, it would have magically had, like, a whole scene devoted to it. <laughs> I know exactly what it was doing inside that corpse now. Now I understand what happened with... Um Grapes of Wrath with the whole entire chapter about a turtle. It's just all turtle. I oh, enjoyed the turtle. Maggie so, the maggot is alive, I right, think, somewhere. Resist. So I mentioned that I had just been in the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. What? Uh, yeah. yeah, at the beginning of the thing. Oh, gosh, anyway. I have ADD. The story I tell myself is I have no short-term memory. Continue. So one of the things, I met an amazing bartender on the ship, and she was from India. She's from northern India, from the base of... Uh, the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. uh, if you read Iron Lotus, you will travel through the Himalayas. Ah. So the two of us ended up having an entire conversation for several hours about her homeland, um, you know, in, in various ways. And it was fascinating to me. And yes, I wish I had met her a couple of months ago so that, you know, some of the stuff I learned could have gone into my book. But I also found out that a lot of what I'd written was actually fairly true, uh, which was kind of very cool to get. The other one being is that sitting on the beach, yes, I was enjoying the sun and everything, but I was also studying wave dynamics, <laughs> um, which just is kind of a funny way of saying that I was staring at the water for a really long time, and it was something I did through a lot of the journey, was star staring at the way waves kind of work with each other and how they interact and you know what exactly is happening in a wave. I learned some really fascinating things about waves, um, but you know, am I going to use that in my next story? I don't know. But it was fascinating, and it's that it's that research, it's that wonderment that all writers have when we stare at the, the universe. Well, uh, and back in in classic literature times, of uh, authors telling stories like I always turn to you know Les Mis and The Hunchback of Notre Dame and and all those um, Victor Hugo stories that. Not only were they paid by the word, so they were allowed to be a little long-winded, but people would read those novels to have a chance to go to that place. Like, experience Paris and the French countryside by reading page after page of description in these novels. Like, we were, we were sharing our experiences with each other, and we were having our own experiences based on what other people's uh, interpretations were that they brought back to us in places that back then we may never ever go to Paris. It's something outside the realm of, of financial ability for, mm -hmm. for someone living in that time. So. Well, and they didn't have the photographs either. Yeah. No. Or the movies. Yes. Okay. So, 
Um, I'm sorry, we're discussing the very last seconds of this show. Um, just as uh, just as as a as a quick as a, just a quick final thought over here from myself. Um, <laughs> when um, at the time of this recording, we are wrapping up one of the most polarizing, off-putting, and infuriating elections in modern day history. So, any t any uh, discussion about journalism, media, anything that we have been discussing may have been a little bit tense for a little bit more tense from what you guys will be listening to um, a couple weeks you know, like um, around the time of, uh, of this release that's all so I just know. wanted to make sure that that's out there so you know like we could either be completely wrong completely right we don't know yet you know like so we could either have absolutely nothing to worry about or we'll have a lot to worry about later on in, in life. So but the way that we've interpreted our current environment is become evident in our recording today talking about interpreting our environments through stories. Yes. And on yeah, that note, um, I'd like to add one more to Fedora's list. She said, one, read voraciously, two, be curious, three, be courageous. And I would I'd like to add four, ask questions. Question the stories that you take in. Question the way you tell stories yourself. Because as a writer, one of the most wonderful things that you can do is learn how to tell a different story and share that story with other people who never would have questioned the stories that they were told previously. That, that's how sci-fi and fantasy shows us the world that we could have. It asks questions and it allows people to see the world a little differently. And on that note, Sonic Green is people. <laughs> Tune in next week for yet another sing tale of the, of the writing industry. And have a great week writing. Gateway Con? What is Gateway Con? The Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention, brought to you by St. Louis Writers Guild, is a new, unique experience for writers looking for their work to be either traditionally published, independently published, self-published, or to further their writing career. Coming in June 2017, Gateway Con will provide opportunities for writers to pitch their work to agents, hone their craft regardless if it is genre fiction or nonfiction, and obtain expert critiques. Get to meet vendors and experts who can help your writing get attention. And all writers get their work in front of their audience. Writers will get to network with agents, publishers, and others in your genre. Gateway to Publishing Conference and Convention will be in St. Louis June 16th through the 18th, 2017. For more information, visit www.stlwritersguild.org or look for Gateway Con on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. Gateway Con, opening the gateway for writers to reach their readers. Did you know? that Right Pack Radio has an international audience? How would you like to reach that audience in regards to your books, your book services, your author services, or more? Go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com and look under advertising for more information. If you don't have a script, that's not a problem. We will be happy to work with you. Once again, go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com for more information. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.